Hello and welcome to TGIK. Uh, I'm Joe Bita and this is the 13th episode of uh, TGI Kubernetes. Uh, for those who are not aware, this is where I take an hour, hour and a half and explore something in Kubernetes. A lot of times this is something that I haven't done before. And so uh, you get to learn with me as I get confused and get stuck and debug stuff and maybe you can help me debug stuff too. Uh, um, my, I am the CTO of a startup called Heptio. We're working on bringing Kubernetes to a wider audience, uh, both uh, uh, more developers in more situations, but also uh, bringing Kubernetes to, uh, to enterprises. And so uh, this, is part of, uh, this is part of a series that I've been doing every Friday to try and uh, explore sort of the Kubernetes ecosystem and uh, educate folks with the things I know about and also learn something new. Um, and so one of the things I really like is that it's super interactive. So if, if you have feedback, there's a little bit of delay between um, uh, as part of the YouTube uh, live streaming stuff. But if you have feedback, go ahead and use the chat in YouTube and let me know. And so I see that folks have already been saying hi. So we have Hans from Sweden and Sebastian from Germany and uh, Andras from Hungary. So that's awesome. Welcome, guys. Uh, uh, Davinum from Boston and Frederico from Gothenburg. So yeah, and it looks like everything is streaming fine. Like it's one of these things where I boot up, I use a OBS, which is Open Broadcasting System. Um, how, Robert from Santa Barbara, how's it going? You're not out surfing, huh? Not yet. <laughs> and Keith from Scotland, all right, great. So yeah, so I, you know, and every time I, I, I go to start this, OBS is like, hey, do you want to upgrade? And I'm like, I don't know if I want to upgrade right before I start broadcasting. It seems like that's not the right time to ask me, but here we go. Um, uh, so yeah, so the plan today is that uh, we're going to look at Fission, which is one of the many serverless frameworks that is written to be deployed on top of Kubernetes. And this is a little bit of a continuation. Last week, we looked at Kubeless, which is another one of these serverless frameworks. I think it's going to be interesting to do a little bit of compare and contrast between these two different systems um, to make sure, you know, just to understand sort of what the different architectural choices they've made, uh, what some of the pros and cons, cons, pros and cons are between those two. Um, and so that's, I think, going to, be, going to be a little bit of fun. Um, Alex from Wales, welcome, welcome. Um, so yeah, so I so that's the plan today. Um, one of the things that I like to do uh, as part of this is spend a little bit of time starting out, where I go through um, sort of some of the stuff that's been happening in the Kubernetes ecosystem, and you guys can ask me some questions about it. I can give you my opinions. Um, this is stuff that like I'm reading about it just like the rest of y'all. So if if uh, if I do have any sort of insights on it, I'll try and, and you know, give my color to it. But I think it's just interesting to, to have a little bit of a topic of a conversation. So I'm going to switch to my browser here. And um, there we go. And so the first one, and this is, I think, really interesting. I don't know if it's interesting to other people, is this new project that um, some folks at Google have been, have been uh, driving this with some partners around it's called Grayfest. Now now I'm not involved in this at all, but it does look really interesting. And I haven't had a chance to um I think I'm Grayfest, Grayfest, I have no idea how to pronounce it. Um you know you think Kubernetes is bad, but at least we've all kind of gotten used to it. My understanding is that we we butcher the pronunciation of, of, of Kubernetes. Like uh, we, we had some folks doing some training in Greece and I'm like did you get a hard time for how we all mispronounce it? Apparently it's like Kybernetes is, is, is more, more right, so I don't know. But anyway, so, so Grafis is a system for sort of building, auditing, compliance, and sort of tracking of what's going on. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, um, but it looks really interesting. Um, and so it's about sort of your software supply chain, being able to actually keep track of what's running where and when and how. And so um, it, it looks really interesting. There's There's... I'm not quite sure how it all breaks down, but I think it builds on top of it, assumes that you have something like Kubernetes under the covers that you're actually working with so that you have sort of an API driven, you know, mechanism for detecting what's running. Um, and then I think it also plays into uh, keeping track of, 
of where all your artifacts came from, what built those things, and then triggering, figuring out when you have to, when you should rebuild. So that ends up being really interesting. So again, I, it's something that, that is on my list to dig into. Let's like zoom into this image here. What does that look like? So Nikhil checks in new code for component X. Is it safe to build? So all this stuff becomes sort of a sort of metadata attestation thing. You know, you build the thing, you scan it to make sure it looks good. There's a test, all that stuff. And then when you go to deploy, okay, and they're saying app engine, container engine, or on-premises stuff. So obviously it's Google, so they're going to be talking about container engine. Um, that deployment then is, let's see, part of the deployment policy. It can actually look and understand whether, uh, whether or not you should be uh, uh, deploying or not. I don't know if that's advisory or not. And then sort of whatever is actually happening gets brought back in here. And so there's one store of everything that's going on uh, that the that you can actually take a look at. So that looks really cool. So that's something that I definitely want to spend some time checking out at some point. And you can see there's like, you know, a, a lot of partners that have been, been working with this. So that's really interesting. So maybe that's something that, that we can play with at some point. Uh, Let's see, can you actually install it? Or is it just sort of like, hey, we're doing this stuff. Join us. There's a webinar. Don't, love, don't I love a webinar? I say grafist.io, I didn't even linked. So let's see, what's a grafist.io? So yeah, so there's a lot more to go, going on there. Um, is there like concepts? How do I install the thing? I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know. Can you install it? <laughs> Maybe they're just talking about it. Want to learn more? Yeah, I don't know if you can install it. Okay. Well, maybe we'll we'll wait to check that one out until we can actually install it. So um, I would expect that there would be a big old install link here. But there we go. Okay. So that's really interesting. The other obviously big news here is uh, Docker. He has announced that they're going to be supporting Kubernetes. And so this was at the big DockerCon um, conference that was happening in Europe. Um, this is another thing where, uh, you know, except for limited people, like I, I don't have access to the bits, so I don't know exactly what's going on here or what exactly this means. Uh, I know there were a bunch of demos during sessions during DockerCon, I haven't had a chance to dig into this. I think one of the big things is that, like, when you install Docker on your uh, on your Mac or what have you, um, it's gonna have like a, a Kubernetes install going on beside it, so you can like run Swarm and Kubernetes uh, beside each other, both for you know what you're doing on your machine, and then it's not clear exactly what this is gonna look like in terms of being able to install and run this uh, in the data center. I, I don't know how much is gonna be Docker EE. Oh, look, Kelsey, that's right. Kelsey did do a Grafis tutorial, so that's great. Yeah, so uh, Pratik said that. Um, yeah, like, okay, so let's look to see what the what the heck Kelsey did around this. Uh, and let's see. I'm sure it's like near the top, let's see. Oh, hi, Kelsey, how's it going? All right, so there we go. So he did a bunch of stuff here. So you need Kubernetes 1.8 with external admission webhook. Okay, so you need an alpha thing and you need the external admissions webhook enabled. Um, currently, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so and then Eli's, okay, so yeah, that's the Twitter thing. So 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 Grafis uses the admission controller stuff to actually make decisions. Uh, okay, so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. So that, that's going to be fun. All right, so I'm going to put that on my tab up here. And I'll include that in the show notes. Okay, so Docker. So yeah, so um, Eli saying they were saying on Twitter that all the local Cage Dev stuff was in Docker CE. So that that means it's going to be probably a little bit of a sort of mini cube type of exp experience with with the Docker client. So I guess that's kind of nice to have one thing there. Um, so that's developers. So I don't know when they say community edition. Is that just the tools that are running on the desktop? Because the enterprise edition is like you have to pay them money type of things. And so it's not clear, you know, short of signing up and signing a contract, what exactly, what impact this is going to have on most users. Um, it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to Docker folks getting involved in the Kubernetes community. I mean, it's been pretty limited so far. I think the, the, 
the biggest thing when we start talking about Docker getting involved in the community, I think there's a bunch of stuff outlined in the in this Moby and Kubernetes thing. So Moby is the is the sort of open project, you know, more community oriented part of, of Docker's open source. Um, and so they're laying out sort of like, what does this mean exactly? And so one of these things, the big one here is container D. And so container D is, is, is uh, the, the sort of container runtime that sits under Kubernetes. And so this is something that's sort of been extracted out of Docker, is in the process of being extracted out of doc Docker. It's, it's not quite 1.0. And the integrations between that and Kubernetes, that's this common runtime uh, interface for container D. So this stuff is still relatively new. It's not the only game in town here. Um, there's also Cryo, which is the OCI one that's being driven by uh, 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 a lot of folks also in the community. So, so there's, you know, so Container D will be one of the runtimes that that is supported, and, and it's been extracted out of out of Docker. It's it's good that we're moving towards something that's sort of meant to be driven and, and programmed because right now, when you're running Docker under Kubernetes, the most folks, you know, running this stuff in production are running with Docker 1.13. Uh, just because that's the, the latest thing that's been, I think Docker 1.12.6, I think is actually the, because that's the latest thing that's actually been been tested hard. I mean, most of the, most of what Kubernetes needs is already there. Um, and so like uh, taking sort of the, the, the set of features that Kubernetes needs and extracting into something like Container D is really interesting. Um, Again, it's still a work in progress, but but it's it's, it's coming along. Uh, same thing with Cryo is coming along also. Um, Linux Kit is this way to essentially build a Linux image that's sort of minimal for just running containers. Hey, Roland from Austria. So in some ways, it's a little bit of like you know, it's it's a little bit of you know, compare and contrast to something like like maybe CoreOS, where it's a very you know, it's an operating system that's very uh, uh, you know, Linux image that's that's very single purpose. Um, I've heard folks refer to this as a microkernel or a unikernel. It's not. It's still a regular old Linux system, um, but it's uh, but it's a way to sort of build those images on demand. InfraKit is their thing for essentially, you know, uh, having a sort of uniform framework for talking to clouds, right? And so and then and then also being able to do some maintenance on this. So I think. You know, if I were to compare this to something, it's probably somewhat similar to like Bosch from the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Lib Network is the networking plugin architecture that Docker has used. Um, it's uh, it looks like they've adapted this so that the Lib Network stuff can be used from. Uh, it can also be a CNI plugin. So there's a little bit of an ad adaptation there, which is interesting. Um, and uh, a little bit of sharing of libraries there. And then Notary um, is being uh, donated. Notary and, and the update framework is, are being donated to the CNCF. And so these are ways to sign and track and verify binaries um, or packages. Um, so that's actually, and then I'm not, I haven't looked at Libentile work in progress. So most of the places where we see this stuff integrating with Kubernetes are very lower level. Um, I think the interesting thing for me is going to be like the stuff we're talking about here. Like as we start building stuff on top of Kubernetes, Kubernetes has a richer uh, model in terms of how uh, how you can actually program what's running and um, and seeing how these things actually sort of come together is going to be is going to be interesting over time. My understanding is that there's going to be say an adaptation layer so that you can do something like take your your um, Docker Compose stuff and then deploy that stuff to Kubernetes directly. But Docker Compose is, is just fundamentally more limited than, and, and not expressive enough to actually really access all the Kubernetes features. And so whether that means that um, they'll expand sort of what Compose does or, or whether it'll be sort of a more limited layer view in terms of using Kubernetes, that's something that's gonna be interesting. We're gonna have to see how that plays out. Um, okay, hey, so um, I think the the so we have a gong here and we we ring this when we get some customers and so i think uh they had scheduled that they were going to ring the gong outside and i i have it here in the room so i'm going to wheel this out so that so that the team here can have a celebration so give me a second here <laughs> and so you'll hear this because it's like going to be really loud <laughs> there we go. 
<laughs> some people were signaling. So yeah, so they're going to ring the gong because we actually got some got some uh, customer sales and we like to celebrate that a little bit. All right, so there we are. So that's sort of getting started um, in terms of some some sort of news of what's happening around the around the Kubernetes ecosystem. So with that, I, I want to transition. Let's start playing around with Fission here a little bit. So first of all, Fission is um, it's it's an open source project. The Platform Nine folks are the ones I think who are who are mainly driving this. But like a lot of open source projects, you know, it's not them, you know, uh, solely doing this. There's a lot of other folks that are involved. Uh, here's where I'm at. I haven't used this system before. This is the type of thing where I've seen demos uh, similar to Kubeless. Um, I, I, I haven't installed it. I haven't actually looked at it. And so I think we're going to be discovering some of this stuff, you know, together. And I think that's going to be interesting, starting with going through the install experience. And so I'm going to click on install here. And, uh, and here we go. And so what I have here is I have a small cluster running on Amazon that has like three nodes and a master using our quick start. We've used this a ton of times. It's, it's an easy way to get up. I've installed um, Nginx Ingress on this uh, with, uh, um, and then I, I, I have a, a domain map to that with like a, you know, a, a DNSA record for like star. I actually bought tgik.io. I'm like, I should just get a domain for doing this stuff. So I got, I got Ingress set up to it and then I installed Helm. Um, because I started cheating a little bit and looking at what it would take to install Fission and it requires Helm. And I didn't want to make this be a Helm tutorial. I wanted it to be a, a Fission exploration. Um, one of the interesting things though is that Helm itself is, and, and this is actually nice that the Fission folks help you with this. Um, yeah, Antoine's like, yeah, so there's, I was going to do open fast next, but there's also, there's also one from, um, Oracle called FKT or something like Funked or something. I don't know. I have to look at that too, right? So like, there's probably like three or four um, that are that are that are are you know all working in this stuff. So it's actually kind of interesting. So anyway, so Vision it looks like it uses Helm to install. Um, now Helm by default is not enabled for RBAC clusters, and so you have to do a little bit of voodoo here to make it work with RBAC. Um, and so I went ahead and I, I, I followed these instructions. And so I have Helm installed right now. What I haven't done, uh, okay. And then here's how you go ahead and you install this. Um, now it turns out that there's a full version of, of Fission and then there's a minimal version. Apparently the full version includes the NATS messaging queue. And we're gonna, I'll dig into NATS and, and you know, serverless doesn't start with just running functions. A lot of times, it comes with messaging and subscribing to topics, and it's like that ends up being part of the part of the story. And I think, you know, NATS versus something like um, like like Kafka, which is Kubeless uses, uh, there's very different trade offs between those two different systems, and I think that's worth looking at. Um, and then InfluxDB for logs, and then etc. So I don't know what the heck et cetera means. So I think one of the interesting things here is that this says, okay, I should go through and I should do this, but let's actually download this tarball and crack it open and see what we end up with here. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger. Oh. Let's see. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, why, why is there this like, I don't know what's going. Give me a second here. Why is there like there's a big bar up here? I don't know what's going on. No. Okay, I'm going to close this window here. We're going to close the terminal because something wacky is going on. And I'm going to do new window. Actually, I want profile. Sorry about this. I have a presentation profile. I'll go ahead and use that. That's big enough. And then what I have to do is an alias k equals cube control and an export cube config equals uh... all right there we go okay so we got that now I'm gonna do and then I had this URL here so let's go ahead and let's download that uh... Uh, 
So L actually on curl says follow redirects. O means save it with the file name that the server suggests that you use. Um, so there we have that tar uh, xzvf vision. So for those, I, uh, X is for extract, Z is because it's gzipped, V for verbose, and then F because I'm reading from a file. I'm telling you, like nobody remembers this stuff. It's just muscle memory for me at this point. All right, so we have this thing called fission all. This is the Helm chart. Um, let's dig into that a little bit and see what we have here. So the chart itself, there's some keywords and a version and, all, and some contacts. Uh, here are sort of the parameters for this thing and I think what the defaults are. Um, and so we're using, let's see, you can do a storage class if you want. We're not, so, so one of the things that, that tripped us up with Kubeless last week is that I didn't have a default storage class attached to my, um, to my uh, uh, cluster defined, so I've already done that. So we're not gonna hit the same issue again this time. Um, analytics. Oh, look at that. They're going to actually send analytics back about how many people are using it. So that's that's interesting. All right. And then there's stuff like default fission auth token. All right. That's that's interesting. That's an interesting choice. So I, I, I probably if you're doing this in production, you probably want to change this. So this is an auth, auth token to NAT streaming. There's logger. So that's FluentD going to InfluxDB, which is interesting. I didn't like Influx being used to actually store logs is interesting. I thought most folks use that for time series data. And then there's a namespace for that runs the functions and that actually does the builder. So it sounds like there's going to be a set of namespaces that we're dealing with here. And so we have, so is it NATS or NATS streaming? So it's NATS streaming. Okay. Um, and then the images and tags and everything that we want to use here. Okay. And then the service type load balancer. Okay. So what this tells me is that when this creates services, it's actually going to allocate new, um, it's going to allocate new ELBs, um, which is going to be an interesting thing out of this. Um, so that's a little bit different. So when you're installing kubeless by default, it's, it created regular old Kubernetes services. And so you could hook those things up through ingress. And so the way that you get stuff in is similar to the way regular old services in Kubernetes. But what this hints at is that this is actually creating its own sort of ingress infrastructure through uh, through this. And I think if you look at some of the diagrams on at least that first page for Kubeless, I mean, for, for Fission, and there's not a lot of Fission docs, um, I think it suggests that it has its own router, its own sort of load balancer type of thing that is aware of what's going on here. Okay, so those are the values. And then if we look at the templates, what do we got? So we got, um, so we have some deployment here. So if you're doing OpenShift, it's one thing. If you're not doing OpenShift, and because this isn't pure YAML, this is actually, so So Helm uses Go templates to essentially specialize YAML based on those parameters. Um, and then it has this thing called Tiller that runs server side for essentially applying this stuff. So we're gonna have a namespace. So we have something called function namespace. We have the builder namespace. Um, so it's creating some extra namespaces. We have some service accounts and role bindings. The, let's see, so we're giving fission admin and then function admin. Wow, it's, so, so this is kind of fascinating. It's essentially giving all of your functions root on your, or at least those, those services that are running the functions get access to root on your cluster. Uh, which is honestly a, a little scary. Um, so I think one of the interesting things that I'd be looking at is like, how would something like this actually work in, in a sort of multi-tenant-ish Kubernetes cluster? And it's not clear and, and seeing things like giving, giving everything cluster admin roles is, is, is honestly a little bit scary. Um, so yeah, so pretty much the, the RBAC stuff here is give everything cluster admin. So that's, that's, um, that's not great. Let's see, and then there's a controller process, uh, controller deployment, there's a router deployment. When this, my, my scrolling is getting slow because of all the, uh, the red underlines here. 
Yeah, Sean's saying, yeah, the 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 R back stuff is pushing him away from fission. Yeah. Um, let's see. So we have a service here. Okay, so this is a service called Pool Manager, which is cluster IP. Who is Pool Manager? I haven't seen Pool Manager yet. Okay, so we have pool manager service. Okay, so this is a different thing here. Wow, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. Okay, so we have the router, the controller, the pool manager, uh, the builder manager, uh, cube watcher, InfluxDB, which is both a service, and so this one is a cluster IP service. Okay, so that's not going to do it. InfluxDB, uh, a logger daemon set. Okay, wow, so it's installing a daemon set. So that's pretty invasive. I, I, you generally don't expect something like this to install a daemon set everywhere. And this thing is using, let's see, so it's a daemon set that's using some, let's see, host paths. Okay, so that's really wacky. So, so this is actually slurping up logs for all containers, not just fission stuff, because it's actually pulling in Docker logs and container logs. And, and I don't know if this thing, is, and this is just installing FluentD across everything. Um, so that seems pretty tightly coupled that this thing is actually installing FluentD to InfluxDB for essentially every workload on your, on your cluster. That's not something that I would expect. Uh, and then let's see, and then we have a timer service and then there's a UI that's commented out, uh, until, okay. It gets upset if the release, if the namespace is not fission. And then there's NAT streaming, replicas equals one. This is a deployment. Uh, okay, so NATs versus NAT streaming. So this is really confusing, and I spent some time looking into this a little while ago. Let's take a look at that, and I'll explain that to you. Um, so NATs, not the Washington Nationals. Um, so this is a, a it's a, uh, um, messaging system built by Apsara, and Plain old NATs is essentially, it doesn't store anything. There's no persistence. It's essentially sort of a, a message, bus where you, bus, message bus where you can subscribe and publish stuff and, and it can do fan out and, and all sorts of interesting things, right? So if you look at the documentation here around that, it's written in Go um, and uh, it supports HA for the set of servers that are actually sort of like, you know, that you're sending to and receiving from and that type of thing. So there's some fault tolerance built into that. Now, NAT streaming is a thing built on top of NATs that actually adds persistence. And so NAT streaming starts to look a little bit like something like Kafka, where you actually have these sort of like, like, you know, you know, guaranteed delivery type of stuff. Um, and you can do some replay and stuff like this. So anytime when you're using streaming in these architectures, you need to think about like, what happens if I have a bug someplace? Am I able to actually rewind and replay stuff? Um, so there's durable subscriptions and guaranteed delivery and stuff like that. Now, last I looked, and it was a long time ago, NAT streaming did not support HA. Um, and so... It was one of these things where you either had sort of ephemeral messages with HA for that sort of, you know, message bus, or you got durable messages, but it, it, it was all through one server. Um, and I, and, and it looks like I'm just looking at the documentation, at least from the documentation, it doesn't look like NAT streaming supports HA yet. Um, and so compare that to Kafka, which obviously is a, is a, is a heavier duty project, but Kafka is both HA and durable. Um, just a quick sort of like, I'm not the expert here, but this is my, my like, you know, looking at this stuff for a little bit. This is what I've come to the conclusion of. Um, okay, so it looks like 
it looks like Fission is using NAT streaming, but it's using one replica and it's not using like a persistent volume or something like that. So, so if, if this thing actually goes ahead and dies or gets rescheduled, you may drop messages. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then let's see, there's another deployment called MQ Trigger, uh, which essentially probably integrates. It's a, it's a integration with, with the NAT system. And then there's a storage service. I don't know what this thing does. And so this actually takes some PVC uh, persistent volume claims. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Oh, wow. Okay, and then we have PVCs. Here's the persistent volume claims. There's some secrets. Um, which is, it looks like for InfluxDB admin. Oh, and then it does a random password for that. So it's interesting. So like we have a, we have a, a parameter for the auth token for NATs, but then, but then InfluxDB actually has a, has a truly random uh, thing. And then we have other services. Oh, here's the router. Okay. And these things bring in the service port. So now we have the router in the controller and the service, the service service and streaming and storage. Okay, so stream. So we're gonna we're gonna create one, two, three ALBs when we execute this stuff. Uh, so Steve says clustering replication is a work in progress, but one can work around it and still have HA scalable NAT streaming. Okay. Yeah, it, it looks like it's not quite, it's still very new compared to something like Kafka. So um, I, uh, thanks for that update, Steve. I think it's still um, still being still being developed. So, okay, so cool. All right, so that took a while to go through that, but this is something that I would encourage folks to do. Like before you start installing things like Helm charts, really take some time to understand what the heck is actually gonna be installed into your system. Because for me, the biggest surprise out of this was the fact that this is gonna install a FluentD logger that's gonna slurp up logs across all containers, not just the fission containers. And I think that that's something that's really interesting. Um, anytime when you're doing a, uh, okay, so this is going through and what did we do? So we got our, the, the Helm uh, uh, install is called Nomadic, Nomadic Rottweiler, all right. Um, Let's see, so, so Andra says, it seems a lot is going on. If something fails, it must be really hard to find the cause. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to this. Now, you know, the, this is, I mean, one of those things where, where if you just are deploying one container, you get this illusion of simplicity, right? It doesn't mean like, you can put a ton of crap in that container, right? So, you know, they may have broken some stuff out into some different microservices. And, uh, and, and that may actually make it easier to figure out what's going on in some situations. But what you see here is that we have, we have three, different, uh, three different ELBs that were created, a bunch of other stuff. We had you know, a couple of namespaces created above and beyond the, the main namespace for this Helm chart. Um, we have a PVC that got created uh three service accounts role bindings so yeah so so and then the logger so so you know helm does a good job of it you know essentially outlining all the stuff that's actually getting deployed for you um and so we're gonna go ahead and do that and then there's like instructions on sort of what next here so it says you know deploy the deploy the 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 fission cli we're gonna go through, we're not gonna deploy it into user local bin, but we'll go ahead. Actually, we don't wanna down, download it there. Uh, we'll do it here. All right, I think they're gonna, they're gonna ring the gong out there sometime soon. <laughs> All right, so we're downloading the Fission CLI for the Mac. Um, and, then, and then you have to sort of set the URL and the router. So one of the things that's probably gonna bite us in the butt here is that it takes a little time. Oh, they just hear, hit the gong. Did you hear that? <laughs> and I think we had a couple said might, we might actually hit the gong, hear the gong again. Oh yeah, there it is again. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that's happening here is it's gonna go and grab that ELB path 
Oh, wow, a third time. All right. Gong. Yeah, you're lucky they didn't do it in here. So it's going to go through. It's going to grab those ELB names. Wow, four? We haven't done it in a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, so on GCP, when you do a type equals load balancer, it does a GCP load balancer. That actually results in a, an IP address. And, and GCP does a lot of fancy stuff to make that IP address sort of work. Um, the way that traditional ELBs work on Amazon is that you get a, a really long DNS name that, is, uh, uh, that you use via CNAME. And so, um, so what we're going to do is these things are going to pull those things out into some um, into some environment variables, and I assume that the 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 fission uh, let's see that that the fission um, command line actually goes ahead and does that. So there's some instructions here, but then also let's go through and. Let's see. Okay, and then here's run the example. This is pretty much the same thing here. But let's try and do, let's, we'll do the node example since that's what they have. Um, I'll do fission create name node. Okay, so. So what's happening here is it's probably still taking time for that ELB to be able to do its thing. Um, so this is probably hitting the fission URL. So I'll do curl. Oh wait, so that didn't work. Okay, so what do we got here? So what is going on here? That's not getting us anything. What's going on? Okay. Get service controller. And this is saying get something in there called IP. We have cluster IP, and then it's like dot dot IP. It's really called ingress host name. Okay, this is fascinating. So like so their little stuff just assumes that you're gonna have something called IP. Um, I, the JSON path stuff, I haven't done this in a while, but like if we do like, and I do ingress, does that, no? All right, I'm gonna look up the JSON path stuff. Because I am JSON path support. So how does this work? So here we go, we got like some stuff, dot, dot, dot means, okay, recursive descent, just find something in there called called okay so so we have to double these dots so there we go so the thing is that i think it ends up being called hostname in uh ebs versus ip uh when you're using gcp so, so that's the first thing that we got here is that this assumes that you're using say the gcp uh integration cloud provider um, but we're not. So we have to do host name instead of uh, ingress host name is our thing instead of IP. Let's see where what did I actually grab here? So fission router. Okay. Now I can do, let's do that curl again. Okay, yes. Okay, we're able to get to Fission, the Fission guy. So, okay, so now this is fascinating here. This kind of scares me because there's no authentication here, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure that like anybody could start talking to this thing. I didn't see any place where we set up any sort of authentication between us and the Fission controller. Um, and because this isn't going through the Kubernetes API, we're hitting this, this vision URL direct. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is just what the router actually hits, but we're talking to the controller here. I'm really like, that's really scary that this thing, 
is actually exposing the controller to the world. I mean, most of the time I'm pretty blasé about this stuff, but but that is that is some scary stuff here. And and it's things like the NAT streaming interface is being exposed to the world, but that is at least is we have a secret. No, no, that's InfluxDB. So, okay, so what happens is that they're telling people to install a NAT streaming server with a known static password, and there was no place along the line that anybody actually tell us to change that password or randomize that in any case. So, so we have the, the router, which is probably the front door, so that's kind of the ingress for this thing. That probably should be exposed to the world. We have the controller, which I didn't see any auth on that. And then we have NAT streaming with the authentication being a static token that nobody asked us to change. And so this looks incredibly insecure. And these things have service accounts that give you root on your cluster. So that's, um, that's a little bit scary <laughs> from my point of view. Um, so there's a lot of questions being, being raised there in my mind. Um, yeah, um, and so uh, David, I'm saying like contributors is interesting. I, yeah, we'll look at the contributors. I'm just looking at the code here, but let's, okay, let's go through the experience and see what's going on here. So we can get to the controller. Um, so now we'll go back and now we're gonna go through and we're gonna grab their example node code. And, and actually what I'm going to do here is I want to create a new tab just to test. Oh, where is it? I'm going to create a new tab here. And I'm going to run this command. So I don't have any environment variables set. Well, I guess I'm going to need, oh, right, I won't. I will, I'm just, I'm wondering what this thing is grabbing from the environment. I, I can't see any place for doing auth here. Yeah, Jonathan's saying wouldn't use this if you're going for it. I, I mean, I wouldn't run this on a production cluster as is with like that. I like you don't want to open your NATS interface to the world. I mean, generally people run that stuff behind a firewall. So I wouldn't guarantee that that's been hardened. I mean, just because there's a password doesn't mean that it's been hardened, right? You really want to be careful. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating is that you open, you know, you create an EC2 VM or like a GCE VM or whatever, and you start looking at, you know, the, the SSH logs and like within like 30 seconds of creating the VM, you have people trying to attack you and they'll just run all sorts of scripts for looking for all sorts of known vulnerabilities. So this, if this becomes popular at all, people will be looking for these ports and looking to actually scan this stuff and use the known good passwords. It's like running your router with admin as your, as your password. Um, all right, so we got hello.js. Okay, so one of the interesting things here is, okay, so this thing is returning a JSON struct with status 200, hello world. So Sean's saying, yeah, it's 100% public. You just tested it. I mean, you test it against mine? Yeah, we're going to have a good time if you guys start hitting me up directly here. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, whenever I do these demos like this, I do it in a, a, a separate AWS account just to make sure that like things are isolated in case something goes wrong. Um, Authentication and multi-tenancy are known backlog items and will be addressed soon. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you tested it against mine. Great. I don't, did you find like the, there's the host name sitting there. Yeah, so if you type that thing in, there you go. Um, so, so Shrish, I mean, that's good to know. I think, um, I, I gotta be honest. I mean, like I would have a hard time putting up a web page like this with like install instructions without without a big red banner saying, if you run this, it'll be insecure and you'll probably get owned eventually. I mean, like that is, that seems irresponsible to actually encourage people to install something like this when it's wide open to the world. Um, so that's, uh, okay, but let's not, let's not get too, too sidetracked from that because you know, that is something that, that is, that is fixable. Um, okay, and so, so we can do function create here. Did you install a function, Sean? <laughs> okay, so now we're creating that function and then we're creating a route to the thing. So we're creating a route saying, hey, if you see a get on this URL, go to this function. Um, or you just saw if you could reach it. Okay, so 
uh, you could probably, hey, Elric. Uh, and then we're getting an internal server error. So, okay. Um, There's an internal server error with Fission. Okay, so let's start debugging. So this is one of those things where there's a lot going on here. Um, no, Sean, if you want to be evil, if you can get it working, go for it. I can't. <laughs> um, so, so uh, 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 so we have here, so here's all our different pods that are running. We have the builder manager controller. I don't know what's going on. I mean, I have all these things are running. There's the router. Let's see what the router has to say because I that's the thing that we're hitting immediately. Okay. Okay, so Syncing HTTP triggers, not cache, getting new service for hello functions, hello. Okay, so API is one namespace is default functions, hello. So we have failed to get service, internal error, third party resource ex extension, no JS not found. Um, so that's the problem is that the third party resource Data's extensions, node.js not found. Okay, so one of the things that I saw is that this thing's Fission's using third-party resources, which have been removed. They, they were in alpha, they've been removed in 1.8. And so right now, Fission will only work on, on 1.7 and below. Uh, and so third-party resources have been deprecated and removed in favor of, of um, custom resource definitions. So that's been going on for a while. Uh, I am running a 1.7 cluster, so that's not the problem. Um, but let's, let's scroll back a little bit and see what Helm, oh, we lost that. Okay, shoot. Um, so Helm, is there like a status? What do I have? Status, nomadic Rottweiler. Um, I don't see... Where were the TPRs getting created? I don't see. All right, so here we have a whole bunch of third-party resources. Message queue triggers, Kubernetes watch. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. Um, so they're using Kubernetes to actually, as their database, to actually store this data. Did this succeed? Um, maybe, maybe I forgot to do that. Already exists, so that exists. So fission. So we have a function, or no, it. Oh, we have to do the invite. Did this not succeed? Maybe, maybe I screwed this up. Oh, yeah, that didn't work. Okay, so there we go. I, I missed that point. So that's that's my uh, that's that's my problem. Sorry about that. Um, look at first point in section three. Yeah, that was all me. So um, so I think we're up and running now. So I can do fission. So now let's do the curl. I missed that step there. All right, so one of the things that Fission advertises is a 100 millisecond cold start. Um, that was more than 100 milliseconds, but it was a pretty fast cold start. So that's actually really cool. So, so okay, so we got this thing up and running now. So that's actually really, really fun. Um, and that looks like we've gotten to the point where we have things running. So now let's look at... Let's see what's going on. So I'm running this all. Uh, uh, so so I'm running all of this with. Um, I'm running all of this, you know, with my Kubernetes stuff set for the default namespace. But I still have no pods running in my default namespace. So it's it's unclear to me 
where my stuff is running. So one of the interesting things here, one of the things I like about Kubeless is that when I run stuff, it's running in my namespace, in my context. So it gives us the ability to create, uh, to use the Kubernetes sort of discovery and systems to integrate sort of your serverless stuff with a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so what happens, you know, and, and one of the things that is a little bit worse, you know, one of the good things about Fission is that it does cold start. I think it manages a pool of, of containers that are ready to actually start executing your program very fast. So it doesn't have to actually launch new things on Kubernetes when a request comes in. But the cost of that is that things get kind of centralized and they're running at a separate layer from the rest of Kubernetes. And so that means that there's a couple of things. Number one is that it runs in a Kubernetes security context that gives it very wide access. And that's, we saw that with the, with the service accounts. And then it also means that it's very difficult for me to control and segment the rest of my resources in a way that, that is uh, compatible with how I'm managing other things in Kubernetes. So it really feels like it's something that's built on top of Kubernetes versus integrating with Kubernetes. Uh, one example here is like with Kubeless, when I want to actually launch a function, I create a CRD in my namespace. That CRD in my namespace is then something that gets picked up for actually running. So there is a Fission functions, but that I guess is shared across all the namespaces that are using Fission, right? So if you, I guess if you run a copy of Fission for each namespace, you could like start to actually bring this stuff together. But um, but with doing things like the cluster roles and the and the daemon sets, it really feels like Fission views itself as something that provides services across a cluster, but yet it doesn't provide integration with namespaces with sort of the multi-tenant provisions that are being built into Kubernetes. And so that's something that I think is is kind of unfortunate. But if we do like k, you know, get uh, all namespace Fission functions. Did I? Okay, so maybe it got shut down. So let's do, no, that's fast. I don't see anything running in Fission Functions. Um, and then Richard's like, Istio 2 is cross namespace. Yeah, Istio, I mean, so Istio is really built to sort of provide ways for things to connect. And one of the interesting things with Istio is that it doesn't really muck with resources in a bunch of namespaces. Instead, what it has you do is muck resources to install Istio into your workloads using sort of the, the Istio thing. But you can't, it also has this initializer that'll muck it for you. Um, but that's a, a, a very, um, uh, it's a very different type of scenario from this. Um, what did I do? Okay. Am I screwing? Okay, come true, get all. Oh, I don't need fission functions. What did I do? What did I do? What am I? Cube control all namespace is. No. Get. What am I doing wrong here? Gar, it's it's all all namespaces. Oh, you have to do oh. Okay, that's so lame. That changed. Is that a cube control one eight thing? Is that a regression? Gah. Okay, I'm gonna have to look into that. I'm gonna the all namespaces flag now needs equals true. That'll break people. So I'm running a one eight cube control against a one seven server. So I'm doing the one eight client against the one seven server. So somebody was asking, uh, Richard is like, are you running one seven? Yeah, I'm running one one seven server, but a one eight client. Um, okay, so here's fusion function. There we go. So I did something wrong there before. Okay, so we have node. So this is, I mean, so this is the thing is that like every fusion function will be running in this single namespace. And 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 I think what's interesting is that there's a trade off here, right? Because like it would, you know, they could run a separate pool of sort of like ready to go pods in each, um, yeah, and it's doing its own sort of management. You could run a separate sort of pool of pods, you know, so, so, so essentially what you have is a pool of pods per runtime 
uh, that you need to keep with a certain amount of slack so that as soon as a function comes in, you can assign it to a pod, you know, you can direct it to a pod and then have that pod actually activated. So that's how you get down to like 100 millisecond cold start times. So that's good. Um, but also it would be interesting to actually think about like, hey, I, if I'm running Node.js stuff in my namespace, let me actually run the pool of pods at a per namespace basis and then be able to actually control the service accounts there. I think that starts to make sense uh, in terms of thinking about how do you not run one pool of pods in, 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 in one single. And then, and then maybe some flexibility of, you know, different service accounts for different types of, of pods. So it seems to me, so when I did this, so when we did the, the so one of the commands that we ran here was an environment, right? Um, and so I think the environment is the image that you're using, essentially the runtime that you're running. Um, let's see if I were, I, I would almost expect that this was gonna integrate more with Kubernetes, that that environment actually specify the namespace that you're using. And then as you look at authentication, you would actually go through and maybe, you know, read the function definitions from, from CRDs that are in that namespace that users write directly because then you essentially prove that at least you have access to write to that namespace for the CRD and then you run stuff in that namespace. And that seems like that would be, and I would probably have a combination of, of image, namespace, and the service account being used across all of these things. Um, and then it becomes, how do you map secrets into all this stuff too? So you essentially, I'm sorry, I kept saying fusion, sorry. Um, so, so because these functions are, are totally separate from pods, a lot of the stuff that you see into pods, like what secrets does it have access to? What service accounts? A lot of that stuff is, is gonna be duplicated in the function definition. I think you see the same thing with things like Kubeless where, where it also has a lot of the stuff that goes into defining a pod actually and then needs to be duplicated and hoisted up into the function definition. Um, so what can I do with envs? So the create, okay, so so you have the image, the, the builder image. Um, so I assume like with Go, you probably have something that'll run a builder that'll create your binary, that binary gets packaged up and that's the thing that actually gets run. So that makes sense, that's cool. The build command for that and then environment API version. Uh, I guess that's for talking to the controller service. Yeah, okay. Um, so Roland says, I just tried it from the 1.8 client. Okay, I'm gonna dig into that because I think it could, something wacky is going on there because that, and and I am running the 181 client. I don't know, I don't, I'll figure it out. Don't don't sweat that, that's that's not a fission thing. But thanks for, thanks for trying that out, Roland. Um, okay, so we're up and running there. Um, let's see, and then let's, let's try and go through and do one of the examples here. Um, since the node stuff, um, and you said you were running it, Debian from Debs, yeah. Um, the node stuff, so we're already here, um, and this is using an Alpine-based thing, and the node stuff looks like it's pretty well supported, because I was looking earlier at the Python stuff, and it's like there's no hello here, so like there's a guestbook example, but I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure, Okay, well, we can do that. All right, well, first of all, let me go through and let me clone this down just so that we can, oh, it's mad. Wait, where, am... okay, we have fission, what's, okay. Uh... Actually, to do that, we're gonna clone the, Oh, uh, get clone. Okay, so we'll do that so we can we can play with the examples there. And uh, and so let's do the Python guest book. Well, that okay. I want to find something that's been updated. Does anybody like have like looking at this stuff? Should we try? Should we try something? Let's try the Go stuff because that's going to bring in the builder stuff, which is interesting. I assume. 
build the function as a plugin. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. This is fascinating. Wow. Okay. So, all right, I'm not going to do this because this actually says that you're going to build a shared library. So this is using the go shared library stuff to actually bring in your go stuff. Okay. That's kind of, that's kind of a little bit interesting. So we have .NET 2.0. This doesn't have any instructions, no instructions. Okay. So it looks like I'm not going to do PHP, I'm not going to do Perl. Ruby has at least a little bit of a readme. Okay, well, the node stuff definitely looks like it's the most documented. Um, so let's go through and we'll go through and there's cube event Slack. So there's a Slack thing. Okay, I don't want to like start. Hello, callback. You have to watch if I did the, the PHP. Oh, PHP is great. There's a lot of folks who got their start in PHP. Not me, but like the... I wouldn't be too dismissive of PHP just because like it's been successful because people have been so easy to get up and running, right? And so there's definitely something to learn there. So I want to do the .NET 2.0 stuff, but it actually kind of a little, like I don't know how to install the runtime and stuff. So like there's no, you know, there's not a lot of example in their examples. Um, oh, there's fission workflows. Okay. so. All right, well, let's do that. So we got Fission. Okay, so I I don't see any examples on how to um, on how to go through and start using, say, the NAT stuff or anything like that as part of triggers. And like, and right now we have routes. Well, what else do we have? So we have functions, HTTP trigger, time triggers, message queue triggers, upgrade the tool and then manage watches. But I don't know how to use any of that stuff and I don't see like like the docs for this. Oh, um, so this is the install docs. Are there other docs that I'm missing? No, there's just an install guide and an upgrade guide. Okay, so I, okay, so, um, all right. So, okay, so, so, and then there's, there's, So I think we're going to run out of time. So fission workflows. So let's look at this. Um, so this is essentially a framework for the fission. Okay. Philosophy workflow based serverless function composition framework built on top of fission. More docs coming. Yes. Need better examples. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, so this is an interesting thing and you'll see that there's a lot of, um, examples of this where you essentially want to define a graph of things to be done. You want to actually, you know, run things, run things in parallel, have this stuff expand. Um, and, and this is not uncommon that you'll see things like, well, here's a bunch of tasks and the output from one task becomes the input to another task. And so you're essentially creating a DAG out of this stuff. Um, and, 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 and the interesting thing is that anytime you do these workflow DAGs, you have to run the code someplace, right? And you'll see this, like every CI tool has something like this also. Um, and, uh, and so, and so here we're creating, you know, a bunch of codes and then there's a workflow environment where the thing that you pass into the environment, the code ends up being the, the, the JSON description. So that's interesting. And then, um, and then the route, you route to the workflow, which I guess lets you interact with the workflow. Uh, yeah, I mean, auth, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> I keep coming back to this auth ends up being a really big thing for all these things. And I wonder like, can you parameterize the workflow at all? Right. Or do you just trigger it and say, like, make the thing happen? Right. Or is there a way to actually sort of pass stuff in? So let's look at examples for this. We're not going to have time to install this, but like whales, misc, sleep a lot, slack weather. It's like mule and serverless. I don't know. I haven't used mule. So, um, and so, so one of the interesting, so this is fascinating. So, um, so Google, when I was as a Google for like 10 years, and so Google has like, I don't know, like a dozen workflow systems like this. 
And, and the big motivator for Google was running something like a MapReduce pipeline, where you're going to run like 12 different MapReduces, some of them in parallel, some of them not, and then have it write data in and out to, to different, different sort of network uh, uh, file systems and such. And, um, and one of the things is, is that uh, these managing these workflow definitions ends up being really finicky, right? So this ends up being really tricky to do this stuff. And um, and so the same sort of language for describing Borg jobs, this thing called BCL, was used for one of my favorite sort of workflow things in uh, in Google. And so and then there's an open source sort of like inspired thing from that called JSONnet, um, which is a way to 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 essentially write programs that kind of feel like config that compile down to JSON. And so I think it'd be really interesting to see if something like this workflow, you know, DAG could be simplified with something like um, with something like JSON it. But okay, so let's see. So we have here, I'm trying to see how, like how parameters work. So we fetch the weather from input. So we're going to run this the inputs, there's an API key. I don't know where that comes from. There's deploy. Okay, so you can post stuff to here. So here we're posting to Slack weather, but this is just the input itself. So that's fascinating. Okay, you can set up a slash command there. So form data to JSON. Okay, so this comes in and wait, where's the the workflow? Oh, this is the YAML version of it. Okay, so this thing Fetch weather, blah, 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 create results. Invocation inputs, index of. So we're actually sort of running. Wow, so this thing is actually running like substrings and index. What language is this? Is this like, is this JavaScript, I think? So there's a little bit of like mixing of, of description and code going on here that's kind of interesting. Um, so workflow can have inputs like every, every every other fission system. So yeah, that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense there. Okay, so that's, I think we're running out of time. So this is really interesting. I like the workflow stuff built on top of it. That's a really neat idea. And I like the idea that the workflow is another runtime with like the workflow description being the, being the program file, right? That's actually really cool. Um, that, and that's a good, that's a really interesting idea. Um, I also the thing I, I do like about Fission is that it has a, a a first class idea of these environments with functions and and images and stuff like that, which which means that it's fundamentally going to feel a little bit more flexible than something like Lambda, where you only get the choices that that are are there. And I know that there's instructions in Kubeless, for example, on how to create new environments or new runtimes, but those instructions are are um, those instructions are a little, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's more of an advanced topic to be able to do that stuff. One of the things I'm interested in is how does like, how does Fission go through and, and, you know, manage that pool of containers. I think that's super interesting. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Get all... What am I doing wrong here? Cube control, cube control, all namespaces. What the, I don't know. Okay, I have to figure out what's going on with my cube control. But okay, so now we're back down to one of these guys and it's been around 20 minutes. And so I bet you if I like do a curl on that again and hit the hello, it hits it. And then, oh, now it's decided to scale up to four of these things. And so, oh wait. But some of these have been around for 20 minutes, but now one has been three seconds. Maybe I'm confused. What, what did I have before? I only saw one of these. Oh, no, that was the, this is the deployment. Okay. Okay, so it's using deployments, and here's the pods. Um, yeah, here's the pods. So we had, we had three of these things, and then when I ran it, it actually created a new one. So that scaling algorithm is interesting, and I think that's, 
and it's not using horizontal pod auto scaling like Kubeless. Instead, it has its own sort of auto scaling mechanisms for figuring stuff out. Um, yeah, so it'd be great to, I mean, like, yeah, seeing a little bit of the internals and sort of some architectural designs would be really interesting here. So one of the things, okay, so before I go though, one of the things that I think I thought was super interesting uh, using Fission is this thing that um, I think is a little bit of a side project from a Googler. And this is, this is um, I believe this is, this is the, the, the person who's doing it, Anthony here. Um, in Mountain View, is this thing called called Cube Meta Controller, and so this is essentially a way to um, well, okay. So now this was using Fission at one point. Now I'm confused, right? Okay, so examples. Maybe he reworked it all. Okay, so at one point this was using Fission, but I guess maybe it's not now. Maybe, maybe, maybe it got re-platformed off of Fission. I apologize if I'm. Examples Fission, add Fission UI. All right, so I, I, I apologize. So this was using Fission at one point. I don't know if it still is. Um, and so this is an idea of like a serverless type of thing for creating controllers, making it really easy to, uh, or I'll have to look to see what happened there. Because I know last time I looked at this, it definitely was using Fission. Um, but, but like, for example, like, okay, so, so here's an example is that like, like doing blue green deployments in Kubernetes is not something that is supported out the gate and it's not something that's supported by the deployment object. Um, and the reason why, if I were to guess, I, I wasn't in the discussions when people were talking about this is that when you're doing a blue green deployment, what you do is you have the old thing and the new thing, you have them both running at the same time. And the way that you choose which one you're talking to is with steering a, a load balancer to, to either one of these things. And so traditionally when you're doing blue green deployments, you have to impact not only the workloads, but you have to reconfigure the load balancer. And right now, if you look at deployment, it doesn't know about any load balances that are incoming to that deployment. So a blue green deployment has to take a dependency on a new object that regular deployments don't take advantage of. And so that makes it different enough that it becomes a, a little bit tricky to shoehorn blue green deployments into the current Kubernetes deployment object. But you could build a blue-green deployer deployment object, which is like a type of deployment that also knows how to actually adjust a, a uh, load balancer. And, um, and so at one point on Twitter, I was asking, hey, does anybody have examples? And somebody pointed me at this, and I think it's really interesting. Um, so this is an example. Okay, so Lambda controller to be able to do this thing is what it got called. So maybe like some of the, the fission stuff got got pulled out in favor of something that was more special purpose. So Lambda Control is an API provided by Meta Controller designed to facilitate custom controllers. Manage uh, workload controllers like deployment are examples of existing controllers. The Meta Controller. The only thing you need to write is the hook that takes. So it looks like Lambda Controller is a sort of special purpose version of this, so it's no longer using using Fission. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. Okay, um, something something worth looking at there. Uh, it, it'd be, uh, but that's the thing that got me looking at fission. But now they've removed fission from it. But this is really interesting, also. And so this might be something that's worth playing with at some point. I'll add this to my list of TGIK topics: the meta controller to play with it. Because because I don't know if you look back in the TGI episodes, I wrote my I wrote my own controller using Go from the ground up, and it took me like three episodes to do it. Which you know if 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 you do it enough, you can probably get that stuff super fast. And the, the controller that I wrote might take you an afternoon. Um, but it's definitely not as easy as, as writing a few, you know, JavaScript functions. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm going to end it there. We're about an hour and 15 minutes in here, about an hour looking at the, at the fission stuff. Um, 
I'm going to put all the links that I've been referencing into the show notes. So, you know, you can click on all that there. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for watching and sticking with me here. I think this has been super interesting. Learned a lot about Fission. I think um, the, you know, there's some security concerns. I'm sure the team is working on that. Um, for me, the, the interesting things about this is that it does have that cold start in managing pools, which is a really, a really interesting topic uh, and, and something that means that there's, there's essentially zero cost for installing a function. Whereas if you look at Kubeless, every function does have a minimum cost because it runs at least one, one pod. Um, one of the things that we didn't do, but I think would be interesting, would be to upgrade a version of a, of an, of a, of a function and while we're hitting it and actually make sure that you don't get any 400s or 500s and see sort of how that upgrade and how fast that upgrade happens. So that's something that I think might be interesting to play with for this. But thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, super interesting episode. And I think maybe next week I'll take a look at OpenFast, uh, which is another one of these serverless frameworks uh, because uh, uh, you know it's, it's kind of fun to sort of take a look at this stuff and compare and contrast and see see where the different, different uh, options here are. So. Have a great weekend, or if you haven't already started it, uh, if you're already on your weekend, thanks for joining me during your weekend, and I will talk to you all later. See ya.